TMZ Live, Harvey Levin here. Charles here. So we now have pictures that we obtained uh, from inside Diddy's house after the raid in Los Angeles. And they um, turn things upside down to particularly get any electronic <laughs> equipment they could find. They look at that wall. They did a number out. of, I would imagine, hard drives and other forms of electronics that, you know, the feds are looking for any evidence here to support the claims of the allegations that were put in the civil lawsuits. But particularly of, sex of trafficking, trafficking. Of trafficking. But right. other things, too, that there appear to be some kind of firearms allegations here. And they did find some firearms in the house. We don't Which know. It doesn't mean, it that, doesn't mean that they were illegal or anything right. like that. But what our sources are telling us is that they were particularly focused on electronics, cell phones, uh, laptops, desktops. And you could see hard drives, that they, yeah. they took hard drives. You see pieces of the computer on the floor. They were zeroing in on that. But they clearly went through a bunch of other things also, just, you know. Oh, they were looking. Every, they, it looks drawers. like every desk drawer. There was a safe uh, that was open. I, I got a question about that. Can they open? Yes. They can't get your safe open. As, as long as I guess the, it's as, part of the search it's warrant. Part, yeah. If the search warrant, what they do is they have scope in the search warrant. So right. the judge signs it. And they create, here's what the scope of the search is. And, the, and then the feds can go as far as that scope is, but no further. And presumably, that would include the safe. Going through an entire closet of, I, I get it. I now, mean, uh, uh, what's going to happen now is, look, Diddy hasn't been arrested. He hasn't been charged. No one in his family has been. No one, no one in his family has, there's been one arrest. And that was in Florida with a guy that was part of his entourage who was arrested for drugs that they found on... And the, not arrested by the feds. That just, I mean... By the county police. Right. But what the feds are going to do now, Homeland Security, is they're going to go through all the evidence that they seize, particularly the electronics, and they're going to see if they can buttress what they got already in the search warrant, which is proving probable cause that a crime was committed. That's a lower standard than what they have to prove if they file charges, because you have to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So you're going from, I don't know, say, 35% to 98%. Right. And that's a big climb. Right. So uh, how, do, how do they get there? Can they get there? Um, what's the next step for the feds in this case? Uh, joining us right now to talk about that is Chris Swecker, a former FBI agent. And he is joining us right now. Chris, welcome to TMZ Live. Hi, Chris. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. So in your experience in particularly human trafficking cases, how difficult is it to prove and how do you prove it? You know, based on, I suppose, witnesses, but also whatever happens to be in that computer. How do they go about it? Yeah, it's like a lot of crimes these days. You get a lot of electronic evidence. Of course, uh, victims, witnesses, travel records, uh, airplane records, motel, hotel records, uh, financial records. I mean, it goes on and on. But you, as you mentioned just now, clearly what, what they were looking for were probably all of the above. But the, the electronic media, any, any video of sex acts or forced sex acts, sex acts um, or video of people who were not aware that they were being videoed, you know, on, on and on. Uh, the sex trafficking is not a, it's not a terribly difficult crime to prove, especially if you have a willing victim who's willing to testify. And there, there's all kinds of trails and paper trails and electronic trails that you can follow to get to a pretty significant prosecution with a 20-year penalty attached to it. So, for, for instance, uh, they, they've already spoken to, presumably spoken to, some uh, people who are either victims or witnesses. Or sued him already. Um, or people who have sued him. And now what they're searching for in the homes is anything, whether it be digital or something written down, that they or receipt or something that would match up with anything that the witnesses have already mentioned to them. So if, basically there's right. something to, to back that up. And that then they present that to, do they go to a grand jury? Or how would they proceed after this? Well, this is HSI, and they're criminal. That's a, that's a, uh, used to be customs enforcement. They, they do a lot of this type of work, and they'll gather up all this evidence. They'll go through it themselves. They might drag a witness or two into the grand jury. They might use the grand jury to get records. Uh, through a grand jury, you can demand records. 
search warrant is a little more dramatic. You go in like you saw yesterday. A more genteel way is to send a, a grand jury subpoena, say, to a bank or to a, anyone who might hold some records. And then at some point, when the U.S. attorney, the assigned prosecutor, decides that they have enough to indict, and that's not proof. Well, that, that's where you get into, uh, we think we have enough proof to convict this person. And then they'll go to a grand jury and seek indictments. And when I say indictments, this would be, based on everything I've seen, this would be a multi, multi-count indictment. So Diddy's team has said that the uh, force used was excessive, where they went in and they handcuffed the, his sons and they dragged them out, um, that they tore the place apart and didn't put it back together again. And also uh, just the military style in which they even advanced on the house. Based the on, yeah, based on your experience, um, does this seem extreme, or is this SOP? Well, let's put it this way. I'm a former SWATer. From a, I was a SWAT uh, operator in Miami with the FBI. <laughs> Ultimately ran the whole criminal division of the Bureau. I've, I view these tactical teams as a last resort. You know, you want to use them for drug cartels, organized crime, criminal enterprises, armed felons. And I, I think there are often alternatives than to just come in with these tactical vehicles and, and, and come in like, you know, with three or four tactical teams like I saw yesterday. So I'm not going to say it was excessive. It's, it's always based on the circumstances. And in a warrant like this, you may be able to get what we call a no-knock warrant, where you, where you have reason to believe that if you knocked, your safety would be in, in jeopardy. So they may have had that feature in this search warrant. I don't know. But I always look for other alternatives to, to this type of, of sort of a tactical assault. Why do you suppose they use this kind of... Um... Tactic. Why do you think they did it in this case? It, it sounds, what, I, what I'm reading and what I'm hearing is they were concerned about the armed security guards at the residence, and they probably had information about guns. Of course, guns were found. And so they, you know, they don't know how an armed security guard is going to react to this type of raid. So, you know, they, they, I think they did this out of abundance of caution. But again, I see it as a last resort. Most you know, most, uh, you know, the FBI treated it as a last resort to do this type of tactical operation. HSI maybe does things a little differently. And, and again, I'm not saying they didn't need to do this. I'm just saying it's a last resort. You can see a lot of people there to do a simple search warrant. Got it. Okay. Right. We really Chris, appreciate the perspective. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. You too. Uh, we are going to move on. Yes, to uh, some news that would be absolutely earth shattering. Leonardo DiCaprio engaged. No. Like I said, it would be <laughs> earth shattering. Uh, but there is a reason why people thought this. So he and his, uh, I want to say long time, anytime Leo's with someone for more, more than, than six three months, months <laughs> six months, he feels like it's a long time, uh, model Vittoria Soretti. Uh, they were out uh, here in the LA area, they went out to lunch, and Photogs noticed that ring, hmm. a diamond uh, ring that was on her left uh, ring finger. And so immediately everyone there's thought... smoke there. Yeah, there's definitely some smoke there. Except for the fact that this is a ring, and we found some photo proof that she's worn uh, before she was even dating Leo. So uh, we've not, also... Not uh, an engagement uh, ring. And we did, wah, you know, speak wah. to some people around them just to double confirm, and it is true, he did not propose. They're doing great. But here's the reason why people really thought, I mean, yes, the ring, obviously people would think like an engagement, but also he was spotted out with her family not that long ago. And so we haven't really seen Leo. I mean, we've seen uh, Leo with girlfriends, with, many girlfriends, but getting that close, possibly, I, I can't remember him being out with her family. They I'm were getting together for a long up, time, so but <laughs> he seems so invested in this relationship. Like I just said, like hanging out with her family. They're always together. Um, but yeah, not engaged, at least not yet. Never that we know of, that we know of, that we know of. Right, she's still 25, so. Oh, good. So, so there's a window still. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> she's still got a chance, Victoria. Okay, we are going to take a break. All right, when we come back, Kim Kardashian facing a new lawsuit by the estate of a famed designer. A designer that she believes had designed furniture in her offices. And she bragged about it, in fact. It's an original done. Not so fast. Uh, the tables have turned. <laughs> Be careful what you brag about if you are Kim Kardashian. Um, and look, to be fair, Kim Kardashian has a lot that she could brag about in her life, but one particular thing that happened in her offices 
has now led to a lawsuit. A seemingly innocent video where Kim was giving you a tour of her skin offices. So why don't we play the video yeah. and then we're gonna explain why she got in some legal hot water. Mm -hmm. If you guys are furniture people, because I've really gotten into furniture lately, these Donald Judd tables are really amazing and totally blend in with the seats. And they're so just easy. We have so many people coming and eating all the time. Well, guess what? Mm. According to Donald Judd, by the way, a very famous artist, he's died, mm -hmm. uh, but he has an estate that is very protective of his work. He did a lot of sculptures, did a lot of furniture, and they say that ain't his. It ain't the. It ain't <laughs> a Judd. No, it's uh, it's a. They describe it as sort of a knockoff, um, and they think that Kim has damaged the Donald Judd brand by showing this and obviously and she and representing a, it as a Donald a Judd. Huge platform, so millions and millions of people see that video, and the Donald Judd estate says this is no bueno. Yeah, they, they say that it tarnished the Judd reputation and his legacy, the individual's legacy, by showing, I guess what they're suggesting is that by virtue of Kim Kardashian falsely stating that the table and chairs are Donald Judd's, that, that somehow brings his... Do you uh, understand that, Jason? Because I'm having trouble with that it. That people will believe her, right? Well, but so what? I mean, so what? Yeah, no, it's a, you know, it's hard to, it's always hard to prove damages when Kim Kardashian is touting your product. Now that said, he has a right, the, the Judd estate and Judd himself, had a right to protect and have accurately ascribed to him that which is his. But it's hard to see how he proves damages. If you read between the lines, well, they're the saying lines, the quality. But they, but the, uh, the reason, Harvey, what they're saying is the genuine article is so much better than the knockoff. Fair. That's fair. That that it, it, dimini it, that dim it diminishes right. the perception of how good Judd was exactly. in furniture making. Right. So okay, I get it. So she's put it out there to millions of people that this is the quality level of a Judd, and they're saying our quality level is much higher, right. she's misrepresented it, and we are suffering as a result. Is that fair, Jason? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And then, uh, if you want to talk about this, the, the Clements design, the people that design the furniture who are also being sued the design, by the Judd estate. The, the, they're the actual designers of the furniture in Kim's office. That's, that's right. They've right. come out and said this issue was brought to our attention over a year ago, we communicated with the Judd Foundation and explained to them that there are certain key differences between the table and chairs in Kim's office versus the real thing. So they're saying it doesn't even look like a Judd, but that puts yeah, but, Kim in but the crosshairs. But she's saying it's a Judd. Right. That, that puts Kim in the crosshairs. We thought, when yeah. we actually saw the story, at least I did, I thought, oh, this is an issue that, that the design company is going to have to deal with because maybe Kim wasn't aware of the fact. But, 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 you know what, but you know what's really interesting here? If that design company knew a year ago, I would assume they would have communicated with Kim. She had this video up until five minutes after we po we broke the story this morning, and five minutes after we broke the story, she took the video down. Pre presumably, they told Kim initially it was a Judd uh, piece of furniture, else she wouldn't have said it, and therefore, presumably also, they would have told her that it wasn't if they got the... the if well, that would have been an embarrassing ago. phone call. Well, right, Hi, but if, 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 if they made the phone call, the video is still up for another year. Right. Huh. Maybe they, didn't what make, the maybe they didn't make the phone call. So, but they're asking for profits from Skims? No, to, from Clements Design. Well, but what profits? Well, if they sold a bunch of those tables, if Clements Design actually sold a bunch of those tables, although I'm not sure how they would, because well, that's Kim what I'm said that Kim told everybody that they were Judds. Right. And but why it's actually I, Clement's design, but nobody would know it's Clement's that's design. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I, don't all, I don't understand. Who's on it. first, Jason? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Look, look, you're absolutely right. This is why damages are always the hardest thing in any lawsuit to prove. Because you not only do you have to show that somebody did something wrong, but you actually suffer financial damages. And it's hard to see how the Judd Foundation is going to be able to show that here. Okay, this is Anne from Los Angeles. Let me tell you what I thought when I read this article. First of all, if you're in the art world, you might know who Donald Judd is, but to a lay person like myself, I wouldn't know who Donald Judd was. So Kim Kardashian mentioning him and keeping his brand online for a year probably gave their whole estate a lot of publicity. Yeah, maybe so, maybe. You, you know what this reminds me of? Look, God, I love the Judds. <laughs> no, I really, and You know what, I as we were talking about it, I was like, the how countdown to him I saying something about loved the Judds, <laughs> I gotta tell you. Okay, we're gonna move on. Yes, to an historic offer in sports for Caitlin Clark, who's already the biggest name in college basketball, men or women. Uh, she broke the scoring record this year, and she is going to go pro next year. She's already said she's declared for the WNBA draft. She's the biggest star in college basketball. That's what I just said. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
I literally just said that 10 you, seconds ago. I just went underscore. Anyway, thank you for underscoring. Uh, <laughs> Happened. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, she. But before the WNBA draft, she has a chance to make history here. Big three. Uh, this is the uh, the league that Ice Cube started. They have now offered her five million dollars. We found out from people wow. who have knowledge of this uh, the deal that's been put together, uh, and they said that this offer. What's really? I mean, first of all, five million dollars. For her to play ten games, ten games, because the the big three season is basically eight regular season games and then potentially two playoff games. So she'd have to play ten games. She'd get five million dollars, and she could still play in the w, WNBA. And the WNBA the big three isn't trying to block her but, from playing. But the without. ceiling for salaries in the WNBA is two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. That's so this is twenty times that for ten games. It's crazy. But adding to that. Caitlin would only make, you know, between like sixty-five and seventy-five thousand dollars in her rookie year, and so not having to choose between the WNBA going and making five Wait, five I'm million dollars. Her rookie, the rookie contract in the w, WNBA is only sixty-five thousand. Between only... sixty-five and seventy-five. Yeah. Really? That's all they yeah. can offer? Right. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's excuse me, but if we're, <laughs> if we're playing, let's make a deal. The deal's done. Caitlin, <laughs> take door number one. Big three. Right. Big three. <laughs> Right? Regardless of whether she takes the big three deal, like she's not going to be hurting for money. She's making about a million dollars right now being a college athlete. The the sponsorships are going to be all over the place, so she's going to be fine no matter what she does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but five million dollars is five million dollars. I, I think this is, I just have to say, a, a brilliant move by Ice Cube or yes. whoever on his team came up with it because what they've done is they've forced the hand of the WNBA, which is operated by the NBA. But what can they do if they can't pay her more than that? When then, if the NBA slash WNBA were to say to Caitlin, "We really don't want you to play for the Big Three. I know they're offering you a lot of money. You're gonna get you're gonna get sponsorship money playing for us. We promise you that. But we really don't want you to play in the Big Three. That becomes an issue for the government. We told and you I last trust. year, and I trust. We told you last year the Department of Justice is investigating the NBA." for allegations that it has uh, made antitrust moves trying to shut down the big three. Yeah. So this is pretty keen on Ice Cube's part. Of course, they got to come up with the $5 million to pay her if she, but they if she chooses it. Oh, no, big three. The big three, right. 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 <laughs> That's the whole thing, right. What's going on? This is Chives in New York City. This would be an awesome opportunity for women in America, especially with basketball, because a lot of them have to go overseas in the offseason to make extra money. If they're given the option to play in the big three in the offseason, they don't have to do something like that. And you can see a bunch of other female athletes, basketball players, maybe some other sports too, get involved and not have to see American athletes, females go overseas to make their extra money in the offseason. By the way, she would be the first. They have. Uh, women who coach in Big Three. Uh, in fact, one of them has won the championship, um, but they don't, haven't had any female players. Caitlin would be the first. Wow. That is amazing. Yeah. Okay, we're taking a break. All right. When we come back, President Biden is going all out for a fundraising event like you have never seen on a campaign trail. It's going down in New York City tomorrow night. We're going to be joined by one of the administration guys who's uh, helped put this thing together. The celebrities are huge, and even bigger than the celebrities, some of the political firepower that they're rolling out on stage at Radio City. Well, President Biden is uh, bringing out all the big guns when it comes to fundraising. Uh, there's an event that's going down in New York City this week on Thursday night at Radio City Music Hall. So already you know that it's, it's going to be grand. grand. But <laughs> then when you start seeing the lineup for this uh, event, it is crazy the number of celebrities who are coming out by the way this is just these are just the entertainers well, Lizzo, Leah Michelle, Cynthia Erivo, Ben Platt, Mindy Kaling she's going to host hosting gonna host. Queen Latifah is going to be there but I that mean, but by the way th there's even bigger stuff coming right the fact that um oh i don't know you're going to have three presidents uh gathered at Radio City Music Hall Bill Clinton, Barack Obama and of course Sitting president, uh, Joe Biden, will be there, and they're going to drum up a lot of Ticket, money. Tickets <laughs> range from $225 to $500,000, which really... presumably is meet and greet and after party and whatnot. Yeah. But this is a, honestly, I mean, I've been covering politics forever. Um, this is one of the biggest events I've ever seen. And it feels like there's 
a lot at stake here. Like this shows you how much the administration understands what is at stake uh, in this election. Because when you roll out the out of the gates with a, a fundraiser like this, I think it, it says something. So joining us right now uh, to talk about this event, Kevin Munoz uh, is one of President Biden's advisors, senior uh, senior, senior advisor. advisors, uh, and he is joining us to talk about. <laughs> the big gala. I, I guess you, you, this qualifies as a gala. Right. If this doesn't, nothing does. Kevin, <laughs> welcome to DMZ Live. Thanks for having me. So it goes down tomorrow night. Um, I, I just want to start with what top of mind for me. The security for this must be to have massive to have th three, uh, two former presidents and a sitting president, you know, among other people. It must be like an inauguration almost. Yeah, look, I think, you know, you might guess this, but this took a couple of months to plan, especially guess, with yes. scheduling, <laughs> especially uh, with Secret Service and all of those needs. But I think we're super excited about this. Look, this is a show of force. We are seeing all of those celebrities. I came with a little TMC exclusive. We also have an after party with DJ D-Nice and the First Lady after oh. tomorrow's fundraiser. But look, this is a split screen. We have Americans across the country, entertainers across the country that are excited. They understand the stakes of this election. And then you got Donald Trump. He's sitting down at Mar-a-Lago. The only time he leaves is to go to court and he's got no cash. And that's how you win elections. It does feel like this has become a, a war of who can raise the most money. And obviously you guys feel that having this murderer's row of uh, celebrities there at, at a grand you know, venue like Radio City Music Hall is a way to win that battle. Yeah, I think it's super important. Look, these are musicians. These are artists that are trusted. They have their own social media platforms to talk about the stakes of this election. And look, when you look at the money that we are raising, which is overwhelmingly from grassroots donors, so, you know, regular people like you and I, I don't know, you guys are a little bit more important than me, but uh, uh, this is money going to voters. This is money going to voters in the battleground states. And when you look at what Trump is doing, that money, we don't know where it's going. It might be going to legal fees. It's certainly not going to the people that will decide this election. Uh, so we're really excited. Kevin, I'm curious about the big disparity in ticket price for this event. What exactly would you get if you bought a $225 ticket? Is that just, just get you through the door, standing room only? Do you get a seat? Yeah, well, there's going to be you know, a range of kind of exciting opportunities tomorrow. Some of the top donors might be meeting or getting a photo from any Leibowitz. We also have these grassroots donors that are going to come in and really see an exciting uh, slate of performers. Some of the people that you mentioned. We're also going to have a moderated conversation by Stephen Colbert to talk a lot more about some of the most important issues of this election. You're also going to hear from Mindy Kaling, which is going to be really fun. You know, she's not always out there doing these political events. So it's really exciting to have them a part of this. Uh, but look, it's going to be a different choose your own adventure for everybody that's coming. You know, one of the things I, I just want to, I, we love having you on because I've been, I think about this all the time. So I would love to test it, that it just seems to me that most people have made their minds up already. And that, you know, it, that there are such differences between the two candidates that, um, you know, you choose one or the other. And I think given that people already um, had the first go around um, in 2020, um, there's not a lot of room for shifting at this point. I mean, the country is so divided. So it seems to me that the biggest issue is getting out the vote that, you know, it, these two candidates, for whatever reason, are uninspiring to the majority of voters. And so am I right here that getting out the vote has got to be the end game? Well, look, it's totally interesting that, you know, Joe Biden got the most tickets in history in 2020 for his for his election bid. But when it comes down to those swing states that determine the, the fate of the White House, it was approximately 40,000 votes. So you're right. absolutely right that we got to do the work to activate those 40,000 and more voters that will determine the fate of this election. Donald Trump mounted an insurrection. He tried to overthrow our democracy. He is running on a national abortion ban. He wants to gut the Affordable Care Act. And so we got to make sure that message gets to people, especially come November. And that's going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of time. And that's what we're doing. I want to follow up on that. People saw it. I can't imagine there are many Americans who didn't see what happened on January 6th. Yet there is a Still. large group of people that 
are supporting Trump and the things he's saying about it. How do you? I, I, I'm, I'm so wondering how, do how you, you use process, that against them. Yeah, if they when already they don't care. That's right. If right. you if they if they know and have already formed that opinion, what do you do? A good majority of the American people do not want his chaos, his division, his attacks on democracy. And so it's all about reaching out to those voters. And when you look at these Republican primaries, these are Republicans, and there's hundreds of thousands, if not close to millions in these primaries alone, that are actively voting against Donald Trump. They do not want him to be president. So we got to look into reaching those voters and saying, hey, you don't have to agree with President Biden on every single issue, but we support democracy. We support the Constitution. We support you know, the norms of American democracy. That's exactly what we're in the early stages of doing, because we think those voters might determine this election. Kevin, we really Thank appreciate you, having you on. Thanks for having me. Uh, wow, what an it, event. Gonna, I, I mean, you know that the Secret Service is there now. Oh, they've been there for a week. For a week. Several weeks. Yeah. yeah. Okay, taking a break. Okay, when we come back, Rebel Wilson is now telling the story that Sasha Baron Cohen did not want her to tell. Screw the book. She's just telling you what happened on the set of their movie and what she claims Sasha wanted to do to her. No ifs, ands, or... Welcome back to TMZ Live. Rebel Wilson uh, said that Sasha Baron Cohen and his attorneys were threatening her, telling her she could not put this story from uh, a film that they made together, that she could not put this in her memoir. She wanted to tell the story and describe why she has described him as a major blank. <laughs> uh, butthole. Butthole. Yes, there's a nice way of saying it. Um, this was the the movie was the Brothers Grimm. Brothers Grimsby. Yeah. Grimsby, which um, did not do well. No, so it did not. Not so, not many people saw it. Yeah, it's but actually, I'm shocked that either of them would want to talk about it. She said but, during filming, it's going to go in the book because now she has actually just come out and told the story. So you actually don't need to even buy the book to get the story now. She's just decided oh, to don't say that. Blast. Well, you can read it for other things, but not for this particular That's story, because she's told it now. Because this we is... know the the whole butt story. <laughs> you said we were gonna do this story with a straight face. Yes. So, um, she has told the story, and she says basically while they were on set, before their cameras were not rolling, she had a conversation with Sasha, explaining to him that she doesn't like to do and doesn't do nudity in films. And then, according to her, he summoned over a PA and said, we need to film a new scene for the movie. Um, I guess make it sound like he just dreamed up this scene in reaction to what she said about not doing nudity. At least that's the way she's presenting it. Uh, and then she says that Sasha said this. Uh, he pulls his pants down and it says very matter of factly, okay now, I want you to stick your finger up my blank. And I'm like, what? No! So she is saying that um, it was disgusting. She, she said it right. goes against everything that they knew she wouldn't do. Um, he is telling a different story. He is totally denying these claims. He's saying that this was all a part of the script and in fact also provided nine crew members who were a part of this movie with anonymous statements saying that Rebel was where, well aware of the scene and what was going on. It's interesting to hear her fighting back in addition to the claims that you guys mentioned she also brings up in the book that apparently he had been pressuring her for quite some time to do nudity scenes and she made it very clear that she was not okay with that. When the movie was what, 2006? 16 it was filmed was that right yeah yeah it was 2016 and rebel even said at the time that she was not going to promote the film at all which maybe played a reason on why it did so badly yeah it's interesting so um there were threats made by sasha's team uh to rebels publisher and her uh you better not publish this or else but she has made it clear uh this is going in the book she's stand standing by it and, and saying it happened even if it didn't go in the book she's now said it so obviously she feels strongly that she's clearly telling the truth and that She's not worried about him suing. Now, Sa now I guess the ball's in Sasha's court because if you were saying this absolutely didn't happen, it would seem like he would sue her unless he makes a decision he doesn't want to go through all of Although, that. Although, it could be one of the more entertaining cases since Gwyneth Paltrow. It really would be. So, think about it, Sasha. Hi, I'm Camden Hyde calling in from North Carolina. And... Guys, we know that actors are always trying to push the limits with what they can do on screen, but I think there has to be a line, especially when it is a scene that involves 
something like this. And I don't think any actor should be subject to anything that makes them uncomfortable, especially with their body or someone else's body. But I don't know. I totally get why, if she really didn't know that this was something, he says it was in the script, she's making it sound like it was made it, it was up. extemporaneous, and, if, and she said she made her, her made her position very clear going into the movie. She if didn't, she didn't yeah. know that was, scene was there, and suddenly that here's that. I get why that would be completely shot upsetting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna move on. Yes, to uh, Travis Kelsey, who wants you to understand what's going on with his body um, after <laughs> the photos. I, I, I'm gonna quibble with this in a minute uh, about the photos of himself and his girlfriend Taylor Swift while they were on vacation in the Bahamas. People saw the photos, and some described his body as a dad bod, which I guess is kind of hurtful if you're a NFL superstar. Do you um, think uh, he, that's not a dad bod to me? I mean, I, I realize that he could have less body fat, perhaps, but well, that's the whole. No, part I know, about being but I mean, dad bod. there's a line, and I don't think he's over that line for that. I don't know. What do I know? Well, he uh, heard the criticism and responded to it on his podcast. Uh, here's what Travis has Do they to talk say. about football on this thing? Well, this is about football-ish, sort of. I have a question. How, yeah, who's a, if, you, if you had a drinking contest, who's winning? At a drinking contest? Yeah. I'm pretty sure I've beaten Jason the last three to five times. Mm -hmm. He's on a This is off. completely made up. Yeah, well, I can I definitely might, drink yeah. more volume. I don't even think that's a question. What? Yeah. What? You think... You yeah, could, you're already down to 260. I'm, I'm we're, 283. We're, we're, we're in the same weight class now. <laughs> Two, yeah, I know, but I'm. You don't have the heart right, that I do when it still, comes to drinking. Whoa. It's March. Not we're hard. in the same weight class right now. All right. Well, it it's on like Donkey Kong. <laughs> is, <I'm> gonna, <laughs> we're gonna figure out. We're gonna enter ourselves into this drinking contest, maybe at the shore or something. So when he says it's March, what he's saying is it's off season. He's not training. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, they, they, they last played in the Super Bowl basically in early February, and they don't have to do anything, the Chiefs, I mean, uh, don't have to do anything mandatory, basically until May-ish. What a good then, job that is. And then even then, <laughs> they don't have to play yeah, a relevant game until September. So he has plenty of time. Now, I will say he normally plays at around 250, which is a little bit heavy-ish for a tight end, so to your guys' point. Uh, but he's 6'5". He but he's 6'5". Well, yeah, but most tight ends in the 230-ish, 240-ish range. But he generally looks like this a little bit, but he is a little bit thicker. Uh, uh, but So for him to say that he's in the 280-ish weight class range right now says that he's probably about 10, 15-ish pounds overweight. So. Yeah, that's fair. That's And that would be dad bod. That's, I, okay, <laughs> I guess. I mean, we have so many other things to argue about. Indeed. Hey, it's Toria in Detroit. And first of all, most dads would love to have Travis Kelsey's dad bod. Um, he is in the off season. I agree. He can let it go a little bit. And that man is in love. So let him have his little bit of weight. As long as he comes back in September, ready to go, I'm fine with it. Now we know why he went to the dog pound yesterday. Yeah. Boom. Because he heard all the criticism. He's like, I, I got to get in the <laughs> gym. gym. I can't, in LA. can't have these Swifties talking about me like that. <laughs> okay, we're going to take a break. All right, when we come back, Will Smith gets a very, very personal question during a podcast appearance and answers it in a very, very deep way. All the guy wanted to know was, how much are you worth, Will? Will Smith uh, is obviously an incredibly successful guy. I think most people assume if Will Smith never worked another day in his life, he would be not just comfortable, he would be fabulously wealthy for the rest of his life. I right? think that's true. Well, uh, that question, uh, in a different form, uh, different words, came up during uh, a conversation he had with uh, Complex Magazine. And he was asked point blank about his net worth. There are a bunch of numbers floating around on the internet. Um, they threw one out to him. God, I hope he didn't answer this. And, well, he answered, but not the way you're thinking. In <laughs> a much deeper way. A quick Google search says mm -hmm. that your net worth is $350 million. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? Um, I don't even know, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't discuss such things. The first half of my life was gather, gather, gather. Mm -hmm. And the second half of my life is going to be, you know... Give, 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 give. Give. I'm in that, that phase of my life um, that can actually be scary. When you realize that no relationship, that no money, that no kids, no, that like there's literally nothing that can make you happy. And you reconcile that you gotta make happy in here. Wow, 
nothing can make you happy? Yeah, I, I, mean, I get the argument about money isn't gonna I, make I'm you not, happy. I but, mean, what he's saying is that you've gotta be fundamentally happy with yourself in order then to have a good relationship, to have a good relationship with your kids and whatnot. Right. Um, I think that's what he's saying. those things will make you happy. Right. So, two, so two things. One, obviously a very tacky question by the interviewer. Right. You don't yeah. go around asking right. wealthy people about For their sure. money. I'm sure Will Smith is worth $350 million, if not more, to be frank. Uh, with that said, Will's response is a bunch of philosophical, new age, new era mumbo jumbo, <laughs> which he kind of, he speaks in riddles and rhymes, just like his wife, by the way. J Jada speaks the exact same way. And there's another, and look, I, he's right, I guess, like, you know, materialistic things, whatever, but he says something kind of snooty that we didn't really play. He says something to the effect in this same interview that I wish people could experience the feeling of buying whatever you want to realize that nothing material will ever satisfy you, which is, must be nice, because I'd love to be that rich. I'm sure I would be fulfilled with that that much money. I mean, Or maybe look, you wouldn't know. be, but at least you would, you would have had the experience of buying that thing that you want to buy. I think Will's been rich enough for so long now, maybe this is how he's feeling, jaded and spiritual and feeling like Socrates and wants to be connected with the earth again. I want to experience wealth for the first time ever myself. That's what I want. Let me tell you something. I, I had this talk when I did Bill Maher's podcast, and uh -huh. he and I got into this, and, and he disagreed with me at first, and I think he kind of came around because I was saying that the most satisfying thing is the first thing you do. Like I said to Bill, like for He's me- about the trailer No, the, the, the first house I bought, which was a converted trailer, was the most exciting house I ever owned because it was the first and I felt I accomplished something. That sounds and, like you'll, the first million never hits like anything. No, else. No, That's no, what you're no, saying. No, Nothing not like the saying first that. million, right? Is that what no, you're saying? No, no, no. The first time, first car you got, was it exciting? No. Yes. Dan, no. Yes, are you asking me? I mean, yes, it was, it was. It was exciting in that. Well, well, it was wasn't. exciting that I could go where I wanted to go, but, but I didn't it's love the car. But it's, I, it was a Ford Escort that what, was like. What do you have, Fabian? A Toyota Corolla, 2004, I think. And it was so, exciting, yeah. right? No, it was not actually. It was miserable. Okay, but I, get, I, I guess your, your point is taken. I give up. The gas gauge didn't I work in my car. The gas gauge didn't work. I ran out of gas twice <laughs> driving down. <laughs> I had an Opel. I had an Opel, and I loved it. Good for you. Okay, All we'll right. take a break. Uh, when we come back, Joe Exotic goes on a field trip. He actually got out of prison. Was it a prison break? We will tell you where he went and we're gonna show you what he's looking like now. Got a new mugshot for the first time in a long time. Turns out this has been a pretty exciting week for Joe Exotic. Uh, you remember from Tiger King, of course, he is doing time in a federal prison in Oklahoma. 21 year sentence. Yeah, uh, that's for the uh, murder for hire plot against Carol Baskin, which of course never actually happened. But here's the thing. So he's being sued by a country guy who had songs that Joe played on In Tiger, Tiger King. King. Remember when Joe was, uh, you know, some songs he actually performed, like music videos that he made. So the guy said it's copyright infringement, he didn't have a right to do it, and so Joe's being sued civilly in Florida. That might seem like a headache for Joe, except it means that he got to field take a trip. field trip. Uh, left prison, uh, was sent to uh, Florida where this case uh, is being heard, and so he had to check into a local jail there, and, and the um, standard protocol is yeah. they have to, or protocol is that they have to take mugshots. Right. They always do with inmates. And so this is Joe today. Fascinating. He's back. The mullet is back, baby. The mullet is long, and honestly, my biggest takeaway from this photo is that I, don't you guys feel like every few months these stories pop up that he's dying in prison? He looks he healthy. Look, he looks better he looks than good. ever. He yeah. does. He, now he only has to wait 21 or 20 plus more years to no, get out? No, I think he's, he's been probably in for four. Four, five. Because so, he was in when Tiger King He was aired. in before the pandemic. Right. Or during the pandemic. Right, right. So, so yeah. And just to clarify, yeah, so, Harvey, yeah, he, he also sued that, that guy because that guy, after Tiger King blew up, re-recorded the songs. And then, and apparently Joe had uh, basically had already paid him for the rights to him. Oh. So they're like suing so each other. So they're going back and forth. Yeah. And listen, maybe he's gonna have to go back to uh, court again. Well, he's already on his way back to Oklahoma. Oklahoma. And, um, <laughs> And uh, he's taking a bus, so yeah, they don't even know his whereabouts right now. The, pe is the people connected to you him. Remember the movie Con Air where they fly the... And ain't a jet. It isn't that. He's just getting on a bus. <laughs> ain't a jet. Okay, what else do you guys want to talk about? Hey, it's Sakura from St. Pete, and I want to talk about PD, P. Diddy's house getting robbed. Uh, well, hmm. uh, not robbed, Rated. I'm sorry. Rated, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, rated. And basically, you know, it's a situation where... His attorney's gonna have a hard time 
saying that, you know, it was overreach and, and they went too far with the searches because it seemed like the feds be doing that to everybody's home that they raid like that. Um, you know, they kind of li leave it in tatters, you know, but not condoning the stuff they were doing to the younger, you know, African-American sons of puppies. Yeah. I mean, but th like you say, that is kind of a routine thing. Remember, we talked about this Jake Paul's house Jake when it Paul's got raided. House. Yeah, it, was, it looked the within. same way. Yeah. yeah. One more. Hi, it's Carrington Gilbert from Houston, Texas, and I wanted to talk about Caitlin Clark taking that big three deal over going to the WNBA, and I say go straight to the big three. If the WNBA isn't going to play these girls to ball out, go get that money. Yeah, and she'll, get, and she'll yeah. play against, she'll be playing against primarily, uh, actually, all the other players are male. I think that's right. I agree. It'd be a really cool thing to see. Okay, we're taking a break. All right, when we come back, Shakira has a surprise performance in Times Square, and the bigger surprise, not just her music, the guy that she is rumored to be dating, because he was there. You're gonna see who it is when we come back. Shakira has uh, a big performance, had a big performance in Times Square. Of course, her new album's coming out on Friday, and even though you had this incredible display in the middle of Times Square. By the way, she just announced it like, I don't know, a couple of hours before. Yeah, and thousands of and people, people showed up. people packed into, the, into uh, Times Square. That really does show her power. Um, really? Yeah, I mean, hugely popular. But I, at the end of the night, I think what people were talking about more than her performance, which boyfriend. let's say it was phenomenal, was the boyfriend. She is rumored to be dating Lucian Laviscount, who you will know from Emily in Paris. He was also a contender for Bond. Yes, he was. They uh, are rumored to be together, and he just happened to be in Times Square. I don't know. Um, they happened to get out of the same car together. Uh, she <laughs> happens to have an album coming out on Friday. And they happen, Good move. By the way, they happened to go to dinner at Carbone together. Which so, uh, wh happens to be a place where the paparazzi are. Uh-huh. I guess everything's... Smart. Everything's coming up roses for Shakira. <laughs> it's smart. It yes. is smart. She. This is a good roll-up to the album. All the publicity she's gotten, yep. all the interviews, really good roll-up. And a good-looking guy. With there it. you go. Uh, we will see you tomorrow.